one December 1995, um, I, I met with Dr. Mark Weinberg from Montreal. He called me aside and he said, Julio, look, uh, this is something very interesting is going on. Uh, I can't quite uh, get all of the samples to grow virus. And, and, the, and then the question came up, uh, could it be that the treatment is working better than we anticipated? The heart medication, or highly active antiretroviral therapy, was developed here in BC. 12 pills, twice a day. The effect, immediate. After five days, uh, we did uh, my blood work and uh, my viral load had dropped 90%. Yes. In Vancouver, when some of us stood up in the podium and say, da 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 da, da this is what the new data show, this is the way forward, this is what we interpret to be the new way of treating HIV. And they were going like, you know, it was unbelievable. I don't think we ever witnessed the dramatic turnaround at a single point in time that basically transformed uh, the outcome of this epidemic. Everybody now talks about from 1996 onward. It was that profound. By studying the downtown east side, researchers saw a 50% reduction in transmission rates of those treated. The drug treatment reduces the HIV virus in a patient to virtually zero, which means they can't pass the disease on. HIV is not only for risky categories. It's a, a, an issue that we as a community have to come together and fight. For us to achieve the numbers that we are looking at reaching in 2015, it means everyone collaborating. So if we can't work together and uh, constantly look at and collaborate and not duplicating services, I think we can do it. I think if we want to come in a world of 90-90-90 where uh, uh, the, the level of HIV will decrease, I think prevention is still an important uh, aspect that we have to look into. In my own country, I am impressed with the work of Insight, a supervised consumption site where people with addiction can access the care and support they need. Our approach to drugs must be comprehensive, collaborative, and compassionate. It must respect human rights while promoting shared responsibility and it must have a firm scientific foundation. How exactly does a safe injection site help drug users? What does it do for them? It lets them, in, in the most incredibly subtle and thorough way, lets them know that people care if they remain alive in order to stop using drugs one day. You can't stop using drugs when you're dead. The general public was, I think, supportive, recognizing that something different had to be tried. And so when the idea of doing a pilot safe injection site study first came about, there was actually quite a bit of public support for this. And after several years of lobbying and advocacy, it eventually opened in 2003. Insight has an annual budget that tops out at the high end at about three million dollars a year. 800 to a thousand visits every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Close to 30 percent of those visits are people inquiring about how can I get into detox, how can I get into on-site upstairs. I don't think that there's another public health care project in North America that sees that kind of volume of people. This is one of the most successful public health care projects in North America. For a lot of people, they can't imagine that allowing people to use drugs and providing a place for people to use drugs actually helps people. They think, oh no, how can you, how can you argue that's helping when you're just condoning drug use? You're making it so much more easy for them to use. Well, the truth is people get well when they feel better. And we give them hope by believing in them as human beings. So I think as uh, someone who's trying to prevent HIV among gay men, I'd be letting my brethren down if I didn't say that PrEP was the most crucial, crucial issue of the day. And we know that gay men are interested in this intervention. Um, there's a renewed response. People are talking about HIV prevention again and getting involved in that. And to deny them an effective uh, prevention technique to, to shame gay men for wanting to um, access this, I think is, is where we need to put our attention now.
One of the things I've been really involved in recently is developing uh, and running uh, Canada's first uh, prep demonstration project. So the first project we've actually had uh, to get off the ground to look at the implementation of PrEP in something closer to real life in Canada. Unless we protect and promote the human rights in various ways of people living with HIV and of the communities that are particularly affected by HIV, we're not going to be successful with our HIV prevention and treatment efforts. AIDS activists in Canada rallied to advocate for access to HIV drugs that would keep people with HIV alive. Toronto-based AIDS Action Now used a strategy that combines street-level demonstrations and government-directed advocacy. We were living through this pre-heart era was like living through wartime, as um, AIDS activists and Katie founder George Smith said, in that he talked about London during wartime, in that you never knew where the bombs were going to fall, where they were going to land, who was going to die. I call that period the Dark Ages because... Um, we were a bunch of frightened gay men. It was, uh, the climate was, I would call hostile. And we came together um, and formed the treatment information program at BCPWA. Thank you for coming to the Canadian Positive People Network's uh, community uh, press conference. It's a very exciting day for us. That's a new grassroots independent network for and by people living with HIV. We, the people living with HIV, are no longer going to sit idly by and be ignored. There are many issues today that are affecting those who are living with HIV and AIDS, those who are co-infected also. We need to get, have attention paid to these issues and that they be addressed by the government, the HIV sector, along with affected community partners. Through solidarity, empowerment among CPPN, we will act as a catalyst for change to help improve the lives of Canadians living with HIV across the country. When it comes to harm reduction, because you don't even like saying that word, but you can learn a lot from us about that. And so the slide that you have here is an example of that in existence. It's our, it's uh, many indigenous nations, not to romanticize and generalize all of us, but for example, we have, I'm not going to just say we had, because to stop referring to Aboriginal people in the past all the time, we have, as in today, many of us still have rites of passage and coming of age ceremonies, which believe it or not, we did not wait for Christopher Columbus to come teach us about sex. We knew about that, and we know about that, just like we know about harm reduction. But it is so highly romanticized in that cool native thing that used to exist, not a proven academic theory today, that it's not taken seriously. And research isn't being done that utilizes restoration and reclamation as forms of resistance against, against that romanticization. Well, Positive Light is, is a little bit unique in that it's a voice for people living with HIV. I think we're probably the only one. Uh, and, and so we give a chance for people living with HIV to tell their stories, to share their opinions. And we don't always hear people, the views of people living with HIV in, in, in prevention dialogues or treatment dialogues. So we give a, a, a chance for people to people to be visible and at the same time do something that uh, I think they find empowering. Depuis le début de l'épidémie du VIH, il y a beaucoup de chercheurs au Québec qui se sont impliqués dans la recherche sur le VIH et qui ont donné des grandes contributions à, à l'avancée des connaissances, ne serait-ce que la description des premiers cas de VIH en Amérique du Nord, qui a été faite en collaboration avec des chercheurs québécois. On se souvient aussi des percées au niveau immunologique. And most people consider my most important contribution to HIV the co-discovery of the drug that has been used for many, many years, and that drug is called 3TC. It was a very important finding at the time. It really is one of the drugs that helped us turn HIV disease from what used to be a death sentence into what is now a chronic manageable disease for most people, and, and that's great progress. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the CIHR Canadian HIV Trials Network. 
You might wonder what the cores are. We have four cores, and the cores are the engines of the CTN. It what powers the CTN gives us momentum and direction. The cores involve all our investigators, and the process of the cores allow our investigators to come together, discuss ideas, discuss what's happening in the epidemic, where the epidemic is going, where the potential research should be going, and these percolate up from the cores to the National Steering Committee as pilot projects, and then from pilot projects they go on to become fully funded clinical trials. The CTN became an integral part of the Canadian effort to improve the lives of people with HIV. In 1996, the CTN even facilitated the first Canadian guidelines for the use of antiretroviral therapy and ensured that community members were part of that process, allowing the voice of people with HIV to be heard by the researchers, by government, by media, creating a platform for us to be heard. Cure stands for the Canadian HIV Cure Enterprise. It is a, a collaborative interdisciplinary group of Canada's leading HIV researcher. It consists of close to 28 basic uh, and uh, clinical scientists coming from 10 universities across Canada. Uh, finding a cure for HIV is a formid formidable complex challenge that can even be done in, in isolation in a lab you need to have a really concerted effort with scientists coming from different disciplines, having the input of uh, the community living with HIV, and being able to complement other efforts that are made at the international level. And that can only be done in the context of a large team such as CanCure. Well, I think uh, the Canadian AIDS research community has a long history of, of uh, uh, punching above its weight, if you want to use a, a sport metaphor. And, and I think this uh, uh, history is continuing uh, today with the CanCure initiative that is uh, of the size and, uh, and the scientific uh, uh, gravitas comparable to the best uh, uh, US and international uh, consortia to, uh, to reach a cure for HIV AIDS. Personally, I, I still, still think that the development of a vaccine uh, for HIV is probably the one most crucial uh, area, um, uh, uh, both again, both nationally and, and globally. We are doing cutting edge legal research on what are very often controversial issues. And we make sure as best we can that when we're talking about dealing with what are complex and controversial legal issues, the human rights of people living with HIV and the human rights of various communities affected by HIV are front and center, that they are part of that discussion. We're very proud to be a Canadian organization and I think we've made tremendous contributions to the response to, to HIV in Canada, um, but we also have a global responsibility and I think we have global reach in the work that we do and I think that's uh, something that we really ought to, to celebrate and keep building on. I think the biggest concern that we have and, and about the HIV response in Canada is that we all need to get on the same page. And uh, we've been encouraging the development of, uh, of a strategy. I think we need, you know, the, the health minister recently endorsed the 1990-90 objectives and, and uh, 
We couldn't agree more with that. Uh, I think now the country needs to come together and develop a strategy with targets um, so we can achieve that goal. I think the most critical issue for um, HIV care and support now is that we literally um, have become complacent. I kind of miss the days of activism when people were organized and rallied for and demanded services. We have to be very front and center in the fight to make people aware that HIV is not over, that AIDS is not over. There are people that are living with HIV, have been living with HIV for uh, 30 years plus now, and they still require services. The Canadian Working Group on HIV and Rehabilitation, or QUIGR for short, has identified the issue around access to rehabilitation services as a priority as part of their strategic plan. And they have partnered with other chronic illness groups, such as the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada, uh, Canadian uh, Cancer Society, for example, uh, with other individuals with chronic health conditions that are also facing similar issues of access to rehabilitation and they're looking to try to address some of those issues from a national scope. So access to rehabilitation services such as physiotherapy and occupational therapy as people age and experience health-related challenges related to HIV or concurrent health conditions, it's very difficult for individuals uh, to access those rehabilitation services in an outpatient or a community-based setting. If I was to tell you the history of Canada from the perspective that I've grown up with and from the stories that I've been told, this story begins with a beautiful land and diverse peoples. When we talk about Indigenous peoples in Canada, we're talking about First Nations as the original inhabitants of the Southern Territory of Canada, of Inuit who are inhabitants of the northern cold, windy, winter parts of Canada. And then as settlers came to visit, as, as people came across these oceans and came to meet us, uh, a population emerged of Métis, people who were of mixed race and didn't fit within European settler society or First Nation society and created their own new community. And this is now centuries of, of story and legacy and, and centuries of colonization and, in, and a story certainly in the East Coast where I live of long-term colonization and then a, you know, proceeding as, as, as people settled across the country. Indigenous people, in comparison to non-Indigenous people in Canada, are, are disproportionately affected by the HIV epidemic. The relationship between the nation state of Canada and Indigenous peoples um, has, 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 has led to Indigenous peoples in, in Canada being marginalized. And with marginalized groups, that causes inequities and it's these inequities then that contribute to uh, poor health outcomes. The UN AIDS has a, an ambitious strategy called 90-90-90. Indigenous people are afraid that we will continue to be the 10-10-10, that we will continue to be left behind and that unless we are identified as a key affected population and unless governments work with Indigenous people to be in, con in the leadership of the HIV response in Indigenous communities, we will be left behind. Because it's only through 
indigenous leadership, that indigenous people will listen. It's important as we move forward that we understand that the work that we do here as indigenous people is very important to um, Waniska to wake up, uh, wake up what is, is happening here on this earth and to understand that the way forward for indigenous people and for other nations is to understand the ways of indigenous people from this land we call Canada now. One of the great challenges that we are confronted in Canada is that we possède the moyens euh, de contrer l'épidémie, certainement d'en arrêter la transmission. Encore faut-il être capable de les mettre en œuvre dans différentes communautés qui sont les plus vulnérables euh, au VIH. Gender inequality, as you know, is fueling the epidemic globally. So until we actually get ahead of those gender-based inequalities and understand the differential impact of our policies and programs on men, women, boys and girls, I think we're going to continue to see this differential impact uh, on populations and we can see that women globally don't necessarily have access to um, decision-making processes for sexual and reproductive health. Women's health started working in HIV about 15 years ago um, at a time when um, the women we were working with were very very isolated struggle to deal with HIV uh, by themselves. And we created a comfortable, safe environment for them to come out um, and, and, and get support, build capacity, uh, and develop the social support networks that were required for them to be able to deal with HIV uh, in an effective way. I think one of the biggest challenges facing ACT, facing the community as it relates to HIV, is a perception that with advances in HIV treatment, which have really prolonged the lives of people living with HIV, that HIV isn't as major a health concern as it really is. And I wonder sometimes whether um, particularly gay, bi, and other queer men recognize that we're still the majority, the overwhelming majority of new HIV infections. And although there are treatments, treatments aren't a cure, and there's still a lot of stigma and discrimination facing people living with HIV. For us, Yes, we distributed condoms and we promoted testing and we did our share of uh, KTE and knowledge exchange. And, but really, I think what was most significant was that we returned the focus uh, of HIV prevention to gay men. And in the early 2000s, no one was really talking about uh, HIV in gay men. Other populations were seeing increases, um, ARVs were working, gay men weren't dying. and. To be frank, I think we were sick of being associated with the disease. And the pendulum swung to the point where we weren't talking about it anymore. And I think our work has been unapologetically gay, and therefore it's enabled us to return the focus, but also control the narrative. This time, we're not sick homos, we're human beings who are deserving of healthcare. We need to see a significant shift in our drug policies in Canada. Uh, we are still uh, really ambivalent, it seems, in this country between uh, an approach that is very punitive and is about uh, punishing and prohibiting uh, drugs and people who use them uh, versus actually dealing with drugs and problematic drug use as a health issue. As long as we have police uh, targeting people who use drugs or confiscating their harm reduction equipment or we have laws that prohibit harm reduction services from operating, we're obviously not going to effectively address HIV among people who use drugs. The most pressing issue in Canada is still stigma. Stigma is really about 
uh, creating a situation in which some people are seen as uh, less important or less valuable than other people and, and, and then teaching those people to act as if or to believe that they really are less valuable than, than, than other people. There's no question that there is an element of hope that wasn't there before. I mean, if hope is your benchmark, there's much more of it than there was before. What hasn't changed, this is really, to me, astonishing, but I guess it's the biggest commentary on human behavior. The level of stigma <laughs> and discrimination is still the barrier through which we cannot break. <laughs> <laughs>